Hi, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our next webinar, um, which is uh, Creating Work for the Digital Space, um, part three, I believe we're on now. Um, I'd just like to quickly take everybody through the house rules um, of how this webinar will work. Um, all of the attendees, um, you're not visible. Uh, to anyone on the panel and your microphone is also muted. If you'd like to ask us any questions, please make use of the Q&A window, which is at the bottom of your screen. You can post your question there. Um, so if, if, you, if, you do answer, if you do ask a question that does get answered by the team um, in the course of the conversation or directly, it'll be moved, it'll be marked as answered and moved over. Um, and if we don't get to all of the questions during the session, we will uh, publish a transcript of all of the questions that were posted with answers will be on the webinar page on our website. Um, please note that all of us um, at the moment uh, are relying on home bandwidth um, and we are live. So if anything does go a little bit wonky, um, just bear with us while we try and get things uh, back to normal. Um, but hopefully all going well, I think we'll be okay. Um, the webinar will be recorded um, and this session will be available online uh, on the website, as I said. Um, and what we'll also do is any of the um, resources that are mentioned in the webinar um, during the course of today, we'll make available as links um, through. We'll have something up for you in the next day or so um, that sort of references any, any, any tools that get mentioned or talked about during this, during this session. So um, during this webinar, basically what we're hoping to find out is a bit more about the practical side of getting work filmed and ready for use online. And we've invited an actually super bunch of people um, to share some of their thoughts and, and hopefully some top tips with us. Um, I'll also spend a little bit of time answering any questions that anybody may have um, around um, the virtual fringe platform. Uh, which we launched last week. Um, so if you if you do want any more information on that, we're also in a position to be able to answer questions that anybody might have about that. So without any more ado, I will introduce our panel. Um, we have uh, sharing a window there. We have Francois Knitzer and Amy Wilson. Uh, Francois is a performance artist, sculptor, and video artist. Um, Amy is a performer and playwright. Together they are co-founders of the Low Deaf Film Factory, which is an experimental community cinema collective, which is doing some fascinating stuff with a good old mobile phone. Um, Elijah Madiba is a sound engineer and musician at the International Library of African Music here in Makanda. Um, Elijah also runs a very wonderful studio um, and we do, we do tend to find each other in the strangest of places sometimes. It's really nice to see you, Elijah. Um, Bronwyn Lace is a visual artist and co-director at the Foundation for the Center for the Less Good Idea, where she oversees the center's broader projects and visions such as recently launched, the recently launched ESSO Academy and the In Conversation series of artist talks. Her own practice is concerned with the relationship with, uh, between art and other fields, um, such as physics, museum practice, and education. Um, joining us also in Makanda um, is Alette Skun, who is a senior lecturer at Rhodes University in the photojournalism department. Um, Alette completed her PhD at UCT, exploring how media savvy hip hop artists from low income neighborhoods use their mobile phones in conjunction with computers and laptops to produce innovative media ecologies. Um, so Alette is doing the thinking, um, that uh, has been doing the thinking that many of us are finding to be the reality at the moment. Um, and lastly, I'd like to introduce Lindila Matembu, um, who is a playwright, director and researcher, as well as the co-founder of the Mabu Art Foundation. So um, without any more, Gabumping for me. Um, I'd like to turn to Francois and Amy, um, who have, I think, prepared, have got some clips for us to, to see some of their work. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Amy, um, and you can tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing um, and, and how you're making things happen. Sure. Hi, everyone. 
Um, it's nice to be here. Um, so yeah, we are the Low Dev Film Factory. Um, we are an experimental community cinema collective. Um, so in our work, we, we try to kind of move away from the idea of filmmaking as an elitist practice, which is inaccessible to the general public. So what that means is that we value the transmission of, of ideas and lived experience and kind of embrace uh, mistake making over high production value. So we're always trying to find new ways to kind of make weird, low budget, amateur, um, collectively minded cinema in this country. Um, and sometimes that means that we show up in a public space with a pop-up DIY film studio, um, green screens, phones to film on, props, costumes, etc. Um, and engage the public to come and make short films or videos with us. So that can be either an original story that they want to tell or um, like kind of a beloved film that they want to remake. Um, so we have a, a video example of, of one of these films that we made um, with the public in Bloemfontein. We can show them. Okay, great. So you just got to bear with us while Zoom has a little think. Um, Uh, that's that's great <laughs> that's great stuff it gets me every single time i love the cape and the helicopter i think they're my two favorite bits um but you guys are doing <laughs> that was a great one it was it's uh, lots of fun um so that's you know that's sort of that's um looking at the at the at the quirkier side of things but you guys also are doing um some work with green screen and um modeling yeah, so we've also been doing digital storytelling workshops in Cape Town, basically trying to create a more long term mentorship program with young people where we work on skills with stuff like green screen, editing, stop motion animation. Um, and we have a video that shows an example of, of some of these techniques that we've been doing with this group of young people. Um, just like some of the all the stuff is shot on phones and with basic green screen so which is just like fabric behind you mm -hmm. so i think we can have a look at that video yeah welcome to the city of blood where there are no rules but rules where discrimination is used the most there are no resources without asking the ruler of the city of blood the leader's name is KP, very young, yet so scary and filthy. Freedom is nowhere to be found. People are bending the city, trying to find peace. Either way, they were found and killed. So, enter the city of blood at your own risk. So, yeah. so, so that's an example of a video that the, this amazingly talented um, group of, of kids or young people that we've been working with made in the 
but it also they made the soundtrack for that. Um, but like with this pandemic, um, everything completely changed and we had to figure out a way for these workshops to continue while the group was stuck at home. So, and we were just racking our brains like, well, how are we gonna make this workshop process work and how can we enable these, this group to make work from within their homes, um, like in very limited spaces, restricted amount of space um, and with limited resources. So we transformed this process into WhatsApp workshops. Um, we went and dropped off really, really basic filmmaking materials. So green screen fabrics, super basic filming equipment, some props and costumes, um, just really throwing production value out of the window because this is all happening over WhatsApp. So videos are compressed. Um, that's the project that we're presenting as part of Creative Aid. But I also just want to say one last thing on that note, which is that I'm also a playwright and the play that I wrote which won the Distel National Playwriting Competition was supposed to be staged at the festival this year. Um, so I found myself in this position like many other artists um, of having to think like, how am I possibly gonna adapt this work that was written for the stage onto a digital platform? So I can relate to what I think a lot of people are going through at this, at this time. Yeah. Um, that's that's um, fantastic stuff, and I think we'll come back a little bit more to to some of, some of the practicalities of how you're capturing footage and what you're actually using to capture footage. Um, and what's the interesting thing that you brought up there was the compression um, that gets applied to things that sometimes people don't take into into consideration um, when you're sharing media files over WhatsApp, for example. Um, for WhatsApp to handle the data bundle, um, it gets squished, which we've established as a new technical term uh, this morning. Um, it gets squished, um, and um, uh, so that it can be handled quickly uh, by the by the operators. So, if you are sharing content um, over over WhatsApp, it does mean that you do have to pay particular attention that bad video will just become worse video, and bad sound will become worse sound. Um, so that's why, again, we're having this, this conversation to go, how can you get the best out of the, the tools that you have to hand? Um, and a man who I know is very good at doing that is Mr. Mi Mr. Mediva. Um, Elijah, from a sound perspective, um, because most of us sort of often forget um, about sound, because, you know, we do. Um, what I, I just wanted to, to speak to you a little bit about the area in which you work and then if you're looking to um, to try and find a balance between the sound and your and the video that you're recording how, how do you go about doing that I mean what are the things that we that we're looking looking for here hello hello everyone um, yeah I uh, like Nikki has said, I work at uh, ILM, and one thing that I always uh, get when I'm uh, at the studio there is people coming in, especially during festival time, wanting to fix their their their, their recordings, and um, you would find that the, the 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 recordings that they have done already have so many things that are a problem and even though you want to fix uh, then it becomes uh, quite quite difficult to do so and so when when um, Nikki uh, spoke to me about doing this I just thought of a few things that usually are a problem and um, uh, I thought maybe that's what I can uh, share with, with with you and we can maybe yeah, continue from there. Um, one thing that that uh, can be of a, 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 a problem is uh, I think people never really pay attention to the environment or the area, places where they are doing the, the, the their recordings and uh, or, or sometimes they pay more attention to the video 
and forget that sound also goes with the thing. Now you end up having a very good picture, uh, but the sound uh, 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 be, being terrible. So um, in the, the place or the, 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 yeah, the area where you are, do, you are, you are, you are doing your, your recording is, is quite important. Um, say for an example, um, you are doing a, a recording in, in your yard, in your yard, and your next door neighbor is a carpenter who also uses you know, power tools like a drill. And uh, so you've got, now you, you, you come in and you do your recordings without thinking about that next door neighbor who uses those uh, power tools and you record uh, um, your, either your music or your, your, your film. And afterwards, now you're listening to the recording, it's got the drill and uh, uh, you know, him pounding on the, on, the, um, on the planks like that. And now those become very difficult to remove after. And so um, it is important that uh, you pay attention to things like that. Maybe just talk to the neighbor and say, you know, at this time of the day, I would like to be doing this recording, you know, and, uh, or move somewhere else where those things will not uh, 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 be affected. The best thing, you know, especially if you're doing uh, low budget kind of uh, recordings is to, to make sure that when you are recording or at the time when you're recording, you get the best recording the, at that time. Don't try and later on try and, you know, now want to fix those, those problems because, you know, uh, sometimes even in the best studios, they cannot be fixed. So you try and make sure that at the time when you're recording, you have thought about all these little things, you know, and uh, uh, and, and uh, sorted them out so that your recording at that time is is the best it can be. And also because you may not be using the best equipment, uh, 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 it, that also you know uh, uh, counts. So you try and make sure that you do the best with what you've got. So look at the room, you know, study the, 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 the equipment that you have, whether using a phone or a small little recorder, know what is the best that can come out of that uh, uh, recorder. I, I had Amy was talking about compression. You also mentioned it, Nikki, uh, 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 that on WhatsApp, uh, when you're now uh, sending the files, it compresses these files. You know, and so when when you're doing your recordings, you try your best to uh, record uh, um, at the highest uh, uh, level that you can or that your equipment can handle. So that when that time comes that you're sending your file or you're editing it and it gets compressed, at the end you still have a better sounding uh, file. You know, than if you had already compressing the file at the point where you're recording. Now you've got this thing that is compressed and now it still has to be edited and then sent off to somebody else. And they, so the, the quality just keeps going down and yeah. down. By the time it reaches the next person, there's so many uh, uh, things, you know. Um, sometimes people uh, like recording things loud. You know, um, and now you've got this recording that is quite loud. It can introduce quite a lot of other problems like distortion. Um, now, when a person is listening to a sound file that has got distortion in it, you know, even if the song, if it's a song, it's a very nice song like that. It disturbs the ear to a point where a person doesn't want to listen anymore because it's distorted. So rather, you know, record things soft, uh, not too soft, of course, but uh, if things are recorded uh, soft, then when you're editing, you can bring the levels up. But if things are already too loud and they reach the level of distortion, then you've got other problems that you can't fix 
uh, 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 the, the, the recordings afterwards. So for me, from, from my side, I think um, my advice is when doing recordings, try and make sure that you have uh, studied the equipment, looked at uh, the environment and try and get the best from when you're recording, not when you're done and you want to do the editing because that will save you quite a lot of uh, uh, worries. Thank you so much, Mr. Medibs. Um, there's top tips in there. Don't make it too loud, don't make it too soft, make it just right. Um, and if only we were all as good as it, doing that as, as you are, then everything would be fine. Um, uh, this brings me now to Bronwyn. Um, Bronwyn, in the center of the for, for the Last Good Idea is producing the most amazing works at the moment. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the way that artists are um, approaching, I think what we used to call it was, um, oh, now I sound a million years old, telling us what we used to call things. We used to call it multimedia stuff. Um, and now we're, we're in a whole nother world where, we, where the lines don't really exist anymore. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, um, especially in, 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 with your Centre for the Less Good Idea hat on, how, how, how everything is changing shape um, as we move into, into an, a different way of presenting work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying, you know, I think it's so fabulous that uh, the National Arts Festival is doing this kind of webinar and these kinds of discussions, because the reality is none of us are experts. We're all in a state of trial and error um, in response and hopefully not just kind of a knee, knee jolt reaction, but um, in response to the pandemic, um, but also remembering that this, uh, this form of presenting work has actually been with us for a very long time. And um, you know, from the centre's side, um, we were in the throes of going into final tech and dress rehearsals for our seventh season, mm. which was staged to uh, our, our big audiences that, we're, that we've become accustomed to now, seven seasons in, when it became apparent that uh, this was coming and that we wouldn't uh, be able to perform what we had been working so hard on for the last six months. So we very quickly changed gears um, and found ourselves working out how we could at least produce a, th a third of the season for an online um, viewing. And with that, we invited um, a cinematographer and some other uh, camera operators as well as some sound recorders into the room. The center always records everything that we do in form of process as well as what we then present in the, in the festivals. But now when it became about representing the work as, as itself um, and not just as a recording of a live performance, there was a new sort of tactic that we needed to develop and understand and, and we're learning on a daily basis. And we started to realize that the ways in which we script and plot uh, for the staged performance and for a live audience we needed to do for the cameras and for the sound recordings. Um, and it, it requires a kind of meticulous um, thinking about the viewing of it. Um, we noticed that uh, short form is much more successful than kind of long plays. So, you know, as, as humans, we seem to be able to sit for a long time in a space with other human bodies and see bodies on stage and we have capacity to watch that happily for 90 minutes or longer. Um, on a screen, that capacity is massively diminished um, and our attention span is very, very low. We can go into all the possible reasons for that, but, but the reality is beyond eight minutes, people start to kind of check Facebook um, and, and I think we need to be honest about that as artists and write for the short form, understand the power of the miniature, find ways to crystallize um, what it is that the piece is wanting to say and to um, project that across um, in this 
moment. And that's why post the, the screening of the season, as this uh, series of online premieres in early April, I went on to curating what we are calling the Long Minute, which was a call out to artists, the 400 art odd artists that we've worked with so far across disciplines at the center, but then also beyond um, to anybody who happened to know and, and follow what we were doing in our social media platforms at the center. And it was an invitation to create a minute long piece and to send it to me for curating. Um, and that was a very, very interesting and telling exercise. I'm still in the throes of it. I've received hundreds of, of um, submissions. I've posted about 60 at this point. I do it on a daily basis. Um, and it's what, what I'm starting to see is that there are traps that uh, we fall into and sometimes the same disciplines fall into the same traps. So um, it's interesting, uh, dances, and this is, this is obviously, I, I'm speaking in broad strokes here, but um, the most magnificent, potent physical movers who on stage emit a language and an energy that is impossible to take your eyes off of. In front of the camera, and once they've sort of edited uh, it down into something that they're sending to you, fall into a number of sort of traps. One is that they become beholden to the tacky um, uh, editing devices that uh, the, the cell phone app um, or even Final Cut Pro offer you. I would say be very suspicious of the fade and the, and the multiple. And if you are, if you've developed a work that is your language, and you're wanting to represent that in the way that you would have had you been in a physical space with somebody. Um, stay true and simple to that. Um, it doesn't add more meaning to create echoes of yourself. Um, rely on your body and your body's ability um, and take note of what is around you. And just to echo what Elijah was saying, from a sound and a visual perspective, um, you know, look at your environment, listen to your environment, and think about how that is has an equal footing as you do on the stage when you're trying to hold an audience member's attention. Um, and so, yeah, it's been you know, with with the long minute, it's been a really interesting um, exercise, and what's fascinating is also just how inventive artists are and what they come up with um, and yeah. there's both new work being made um, that's being sent to me all the time um, but also in the case of of uh, our fellow panelists and Tiondile um, it's it's an opportunity to look at old work to look at work that exists and has been recorded and that you can now play with and look at in different forms to really consider the screen as an entirely new staging opportunity um, and to play with editing in that in that way um, for us has been uh, really beautiful and you know William has been doing it himself William Kentridge the founder of the center uh, he's gone, he's dug back over this um, period of lockdown into his archives and has dragged up the last 20, 30 years of, of recordings and he's finding his threads and it's beautiful to see examples of William in his studio 20 years ago and William in his studio today and then a mirroring of the screen and, you know, the two are in dialogue with one another. Um, so I would say where you have archive as an artist making for this time, um, that's, don't forget that treasure um, that, that is your own and it is something to play with. That's, um, that is solid advice, Bronwyn, thank you so much. It's, it's something that has been um, astounding me of late is just, is just what um, people sort of have been able to with this sort of moment of pause that we've been given to then have a look at something and then 
just start to play with what out what is out there um which is just it's fantastically exciting um so while it is it is at the moment i know a lot of us are in in really dire straits um and and life is really tough there's 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 a lot of work that's coming out um and and things that are being thought through um that really are quite quite amazing and it is the fact that work um and performers themselves don't need anything to make their work special their work is already special um and what they do is extraordinary um and it doesn't need to be helped along because live performance is that special thing and it is trying to create that that atmosphere that it can never really be recreated um but it's trying to it's trying to um at least give it a voice um so thanks very much and and what i'm going to do is just um jump over to alette um who works in the in the in the education environment at, at Rhodes, um but also just moving on from from what you've said about um keeping things simple um it was what we were chatting about earlier alette and i, I wondered if you could um and just spend some time obviously you you spend a lot of time with your students um sort of talking through the process um of finding the story within things and finding the best way to tell a story um i wonder if you can tell us a bit more about that yes i, I teach a class in uh, documentary filmmaking mm. and uh i think there the important thing is for people not to try and emulate the hollywood process because you know that costs thousands and thousands of of dollars and to really to to look at what your your strengths are that that you can offer so i think you know if you think particularly of video uh, what's really powerful of video is it's a uh, it's intimacy so it's very it's quite different from theater you've got to not think that you are talking to 30 or 100 people but just to one person so it kind of starts the process of the imagination in some ways and uh, it's really taking people there where they are so you've you've kind of got to perform in some ways you know if you've trained in theater with big gestures you've got to um perform more uh, in terms of sort of a real kind of way smaller gestures uh, as if you were there you've got to really you know use that kind of method acting of 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 you know being who you're supposed to be so um i mean i would actually encourage people to think of innovative concepts because it's really about the the concept so if you you think for example of a uh, of the sort of the classic example of radio the war of the worlds where or you know the um the uh beowulf uh, uh, Blairwood uh, project, Blairwood project, where you kind of have this sense of this is this reality or isn't this? You, you're not quite sure. So I would encourage people to play with that kind of concept to do stories that are really intimate, where you talk about things that maybe you know that feel very true to people, as opposed to kind of try and recreate a Hollywood scenario. Um, you know, uh, something that I was also thinking of you know just as the previous speaker was talking about you know our unique methods is i think something that artists can really explore as well is sharing your method as an artist because i think to some extent you know we just we, we've got to think beyond the the fictional you know the documentary the the kind of like non fiction stuff there is a real market for you know this idea of the master class and often you know for the kind of fictional you'd have a very short attention span but you know if you're sharing your process with people you might find that they might be engaged uh, for longer um as we yeah. are now in this yeah. webinar mm. uh, for example um I, I do think that there are uh, you know you do have to master the some of the the basic cinematic grammar so uh there are certain things that you know that even if you use a mobile phone that are very important so the first thing is aspect ratio so you should be holding your phone uh, horizontal not vertical as uh, most platforms uh, work in the horizontal uh, method uh, elijah's point on sound is really important and there uh, you know if you're close by like i am now it's not a problem sound is very much about how close your microphone is if your microphone if your camera is far away you're going to get terrible sound 
So really what we've been doing with our students is actually recording what's called sync sound, where you have a, a lapel a microphone connected to a mobile phone. And some of these you, you, microphones you can get for a thousand rand or less. They have really high quality microphones that give you super crisp sound. Um, so, you know, in terms of sound, I agree 100% with Elijah. You can get away with um, visuals that are not as great, but people are not going to actually want to go through the process of, you know, watching your, your video at all if the sound is terrible. I, I'm sure you've noticed all these Skype calls on the television. Uh, you know, as soon as the sound is terrible, you, you can't even watch it. Um, the other thing is uh, to think about a, a way of stabilizing your camera. So uh, what we've been doing with our students in lockdown is encourage them either to use their mobile phones or uh, DSLR cameras, which are like cameras you use for photography, but most of these have now been adapted that you can also do video. So those are uh, really, really good. But the thing is that uh, neither of these two devices work that well, um, particularly the DSLR camera, if they're not stable. So you need to have a tripod or something to put it on. I mean, we encourage our students even to use, uh, you know, bags of rice as a way to stabilize their, their cameras. Always um, works. Yeah, um, yeah, there's other tips as well. A main idea is that you can't have a wobbly, uh, you know, as soon as the screen is wobbly, people can't watch. Uh, so yeah, the, the stabilizing the shots, uh, and then, you know, to think about uh, the angle. So you often see with, you know, people on Skype, they often they, they, they fall from a dip above. It's got a certain kind of look. You look more vulnerable. While from uh, below, it's much more ominous and dramatic. So you've got to think about uh, these things where you, you place your, your camera. Uh, very important also is light. So if you have light that comes from the side, you would automatically look you know your face becomes more shaped it's more interesting to look at well if you have a, a window behind you okay my, my camera maybe i've got a light in front of me but often uh, you become nearly uh it's nearly impossible to actually watch you so you've got to think in terms of also light so um you know with filming light becomes really important um then in terms of editing i absolutely agree we don't want fancy effects uh, actually, if you think of, if you actually look at films, um, I would actually encourage people to look at uh, films without the sound on, because then you can really concentrate on the image. And you'll notice that uh, um, mostly people just use straight cuts. Even dissolves are quite rare. Um, my students are very fond of the fade to black, which makes everything really dramatic. But, you know, if you're doing a one minute piece of fade to black is, you know, it's like a chapter. Uh, ending, um, which you don't um, really uh, want if you're writing a poem, for example, in different chapters. So the cut is always the, the cleanest. Uh, I've sent Nikki a whole lot of um, editing software tips. I don't know if you want me to talk about that as well, Nikki. Um, I think that we might get we might get some um, questions uh, uh, relating specifically to that. Um, so I think hold on to them, and we are going to make the the resources available um, for a second, and uh, in in a sec. Um, and I mm. think that we'll come back to talking about specific tools. Um, but it's mm. always a joy uh, to have you demonstrate uh, techniques. Ella, thank you very much. Um, mm. I'd like to move on to Slindile. Um, and um, Slindile, we've spoken a lot about um, work that's being created um, to be filmed and presented on, um, on, a, on, a, on a digital platform or, or screened. Um, and you work a lot in the archiving of, of, of performances. Um, and what I think is 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 also for for which is quite a big step for artists is um, that step that you have to take when you're thinking about um, adapting your specific production for camera um, to be watched not in a theatre but on a screen. 
um, and that's something that you sort of I know has been some of your some of the some of the work that you have done very successfully. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit to that. I know that you've got some clips for us uh, to see, um, and just let me know when you want to share those. Okay, thanks so much for having me. Um, I think as a co-founder of my work foundation, what we've really tried to drive is archiving African narratives and how do we preserve our narratives. So in the past years, since 2016, uh, we've always made sure that we film our work. And in filming our works, we've always collaborated with filmmakers, lighting designers, cinematographers, who really understand the, the, the language of film. And I think for theater makers, it's important for you to understand how to fuse the language now of film, of understanding that a wide is not gonna be the only thing that's gonna cut it now. How do you um, use a different camera angle to get closer to your character? How do you use a different camera angle to pan your character? But also understanding not to disturb your character. So what I'm, what I'm really interested in showing or speaking about today is um, how do we play in the theater space? How do we play with the character? How do we make sure that now the camera language or the camera now becomes the audience? And how do you use that metaphor of a camera as your audience member? Because they're the eyes. They're the ones that are helping your, your, your audience follow your characters or follow the story. So it's important to really understand how to pull in the audience member in that, um, in that moment of filming your work or playing, or playing with the actors in the space. So um, I think what we're very fortunate about in 2017 was um, having access to filmmakers who were able to donate um, their equipment. And we decided that we're gonna, we are gonna really take this on and make sure that we film the work um, with the best quality that we can. And, we, and in that space, um, when I was directing the piece um, titled Milk Voice at the Joburg Theatre in 2017, I had to understand um, how to make sure that the lighting designer, the cinematographer, um, the costume designer, the musicians on the set understand that this, all our worlds have to fuse now. And in making sure that um, the lighting and the camera relationship um, are, are really close to each other so that some of the lighting doesn't blur out or pixelate or blow out the, the image. So in really trying to understand how to make things very crisp and also making sure that the costume designer understands that the shirt needs to be ironed because the camera doesn't lie. It picks up a lot of things. Um, so yeah, so I mean, we're very much fortunate in understanding language and because of the co-founder as well of the company, he's, um, more of a filmmaker and a visual artist. And as Mabua Foundation, we decided that how do we collaborate with visual artists, filmmakers, theater makers, and how do we create work as a community? So please play the Living Your Dream. Sure. Okay, Jim's pressing play and Zoom's having a think. And in a moment, the magic of the internet will take over. <laughs> After a successful run at uh, the National Arts Festival in Grahamstown last year, where it was awarded a Standard Bank Ovation Merit Award, Tlindalim Tembu's Milk Voice addresses the struggles of young artists who want their stories to be heard. Being an artist comes with its own set of entrepreneurial challenges, and being a playwright is one of the more difficult careers to sustain. My dream for Milk Voice as a production would be to one day see it on a main stage, attracting the masses. I just need someone or something to just come about and make this happen for us to get to main stage, mainstream, to do tours. We need finance, we need assistance, we need leadership from those who are still holding on to the piece of the pie and we just want crumbs. Watch what we can do with crumbs. That's what we want. And for us to go full force and for us to really get to where we need to get to, we need all the support that we can get. So please help us get our dream. It's, it's that, yeah, so that piece particularly it, demonstrates the um, the camera is the audience member. I can see exactly what you mean now. 
Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think firstly, um, it definitely has to, your camera has to be your friend now, guys, because um, it's going to take a while for us to get back into the theater space. So I think the theater makers need to learn quickly how to adapt and understand just how to play with the camera or get a cinematographer to teach you that how do I, how do I use this language? How do I make a close up? But also, also being very distinct that we are not creating motion picture work. Um, it's not another, it's not another film. It's still theater. It's still live. It's still making sure that we can still preserve the experience that the audience um, really deserves to see during mm. this online experience. Yeah. Um, you had a second clip for us. Do you want to show that now or are you holding on to it for a little bit longer? Um, I definitely can show it. So, I, so as a playwright as well and, uh, and a director, it became, I mean, when, when they announced um, the lockdown and when everybody got... Um, when everybody freaked out in the industry that what are we going to do now? I also really did panic and I realized that it's not going to be easy now to find, to go to the editor's place and get him to edit the work, which meant that I had to learn a skill, which was editing. And, um, fortunately I found video leap on my smartphone. And I mean, there, I think also a can take you through which other, um, editing platforms they are but I found one that worked for me, which was video leap. And in this um, footage, I learned how to fuse um, a ready stage work. And I learned how to use some of the voiceovers that I couldn't use already and how to already implement them in this, um, in this short clip. And what I also want to explain is that we need to think about when you market your work, you need to think about, um, how to think about how to you how to think about the medium of a trailer that um, that filmmakers use in selling their works. How do you use the same language for yourself as a theater maker in selling your work in one minute? Because Bronwyn is completely right that um, it's going to be difficult for people to stay there for forty five minutes or close to an hour. So how do you make sure that in marketing your work or in promoting your work online, how do you make that one minute count and for, for to make sure that your audience stays in. So yeah. Yeah. Let's play. Okay. Good play, Tim. We breathe our souls in these unknown boxes. We live amongst each other, but hardly allowed to remember. Oguti. Sipumagopi, besingo ban, besbuyagopi. So we trapped, trapped. Doors closing in, walls closing in. Emotions building up. Scream, screaming. Not heard. The world turned upside down, enslaved bodies serving you. Past keeps running away. What is it running away from? Who are you running away from? The memory slips in and out, controlling our every move. They brainwashed us. I see. Yes. Um, fantastic stuff. Thanks so much for, for sharing that with us, uh, Slindila. Um, we're getting some questions in from from attendees, um, and one is is in particular is taking us in a in a direction that we want to go. Um, Anon has anonymous has sent in a question um, saying, "I'm also a playwright and theatre practitioner, and work in a theatre youth group. We develop and stage." plays around sanitation issues within our community. We are currently looking into creating content on our mobile phones. Um, um, and since we are not professionals in filmmaking, we have very little experience in it. I wanted to ask if there are perhaps any online tools that Amy or any of the other panelists can recommend, suggest or share. Um, 
and the the um the 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 fantastic thing that I found actually quite recently, um, Amy, and and I know that Alette has got some some stuff to share as well, is um, what I found uh, was good old Movie Maker has had a reincarnation as an online tool. Um, and it still looks and feels the same way. So you, you, you do have to think in the 1990s, um, but Movie Maker exists. And if you're working on someone's computer who's not your own, I think it still is like paint, one of the quickest ways to get to the end or get to the finish line really quickly, really simply, um, if, especially if you're working on a shared machine. Um, but um, Amy, I don't know if you, or Amy and Francois especially as well, um, it's a, definitely a, an area in which you guys are working in. Um, have you got any tips there? Yeah, I mean, we are working also with filmmakers, young filmmakers who when they started had zero filmmaking, filmmaking experience and are literally just using their phones. Um, and we're seeing some really, really incredible things that people can do with with nothing. Mm -hmm. I think if, if you go onto YouTube and you, you basically do a basic search on, you know, filmmaking using smartphones, it's quite, there's quite a lot of things that just pop up quite immediately. And people have got, you know, their, their list of 10, 10 tips or whatnot. That yeah, and if you, can put up with the, if you can put up with the presenters, uh, then, <laughs> then you're doing quite well. Some of them are, are a bit much, but you, you're very right, Branta. Um, and we will we will put a few we will put a few links um, at the bottom. Uh, I mean, we will make a few links live um, to software specifically that is free um, and stuff that is is really easy to make a start on it. Um, Alet, I don't know whether you've got um, you've got some some tips there as well. Uh, yes, I mean I can recommend the the platform No Film School. It's uh, really great. Uh, so some thoughtful stuff. But um, what I'd also like to encourage people to think also a bit more conceptually. So before you just think in terms of what you want to do, also why are people going to go for your um, video? So, you know, if you think on, for example, from television, they have all sorts of things like uh, product placement. Um, could you market your show, for example, or to be viewed by families where you will make one of the family members one of your characters for example or it will be all be centered around someone's birthday or whatever so i think that's also uh, important the kind of concept that you work with um but yeah i can definitely also share with you i've kind of bookmarked a lot of uh, vlogs that people use for basic uh, filmmaking mm. mobile filmmaking so I'll share that with you yeah. Yeah, the wonderful thing is that the internet has become the greatest university. Although one can't always mm -hmm. trust what's out there, um, there's at least a lot of people um, having a go. And I think that that's, I think listening to everybody, um, much like we've done our sort of, for all of us, much as we've done as we've we've spent all our, our, our time perfecting um, our, our, our trade in theatres, um, it's now time to play with some new tools um, and just, you know, just as the, the answer is, is to play with them. Um, and the best thing to, and the best way to learn is to try and make something um, and to get it wrong. A lot of the time, get it wrong, make something terrible um, and, um, and then stop doing that and make something great. Um, um I'd also yeah. just like to um, encourage people, I sent you some links, just yes. to look at some South African examples. So I've shared uh, one which is like uh, p people who put up a, a kind of theatre performance in a WhatsApp group through, uh, you know, sharing a video on, you, you join the WhatsApp group and then, you know, it plays out in front of you on WhatsApp as one experience. Uh, also Tim Green's uh, film that he's just produced mm, uh, entirely getting all the actors in lockdown just using their mobile phones or Zoom. So I've also um, shared the trailer with you, um, which I think will be really inspiring for people to watch, to think of new ways to kind of create theater and film. Absolutely, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, so following on from all of this, um, we have a question from Rob Murray. Hello, Rob Murray. Um, there, 
um, has the team got some suggestions for a basic but decent gear pack um, to invest in to create content for online platforms? As an example, we've been experimenting remotely, performing live in a Zoom for screen format, and we found that we were limited by needing to be close to a laptop or device to hear what others were saying and for the mic to pick up voices. So invested in Bluetooth earbuds and mics for ease of move movement. Um, which is a great leap forward. Having earphones and having a, having a Bluetooth speaker is a very cost-effective way around the situation. It's not the prettiest, we know that much, um, but it does work. Um, Elijah, Alette, Amy, Francois, maybe you guys have got some input here? Yeah, Amy, go for it. Yeah, I, um, I think these days you can get for your smartphone a pretty uh, simple tripod and I don't know if it's kind of cutting out now but it can be a selfie stick and it's, it's a hundred rand and I think having a proper tripod goes a long way not like balancing your your phone on on uh, you know pillows or whatnot yeah you can um, you can also get um, very very affordable lapel mics um, take a lot is our best friend yeah we ordered like a whole bunch of really simple basic filming gear for our participants then also you can get, if you're willing to put in some time and, and if you know how to kind of uh, wire a plug, you can buy some floodlights and that's kind of the cheapest way you can get, I think a 30 watt light for, I think like a hundred rand. Mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have three lights, you can basically set up a studio. Yeah, um, I know that this, like we've been, lighting. yeah, we've been um, playing around with clip-on uh, clip desk lamps um, and some, some good old baking paper as diffusion it needn't yeah. cost needn't cost you put a 6k in there um and some baking paper and you get a nice nice warm diffusion um going on there um for you know less than 100 bucks um and i think it is it's the microphones that that, that yeah. sometimes people really get worried about um and sometimes it is i don't know elijah if you've got some some input or or a let um of going if you're taking um if you're taking a, a a recording on two separate devices so you're using one for video and one for sound how is it best to get to get yourself into a position where you are going to be able to once you once you're getting to grips with an editing program to pull your sound recording and your video recording together. Um, uh, no, don't, don't. Oh. You go, Elijah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, for, for, for what we've been, we, we do, quite, uh, we, we just clap, you know, you record you, you, the uh, audio and the, the video, and then you clap. And then when you're now uh, um, pulling the two together, you will clearly see where you did your clapping and clap, and that will help you to, to synchronize the, the two. That's the one easiest uh, way of doing it. But also, as you're working on the uh, files, you get used to seeing the wave files, and they usually look alike. You can sort of be able to align it because they, they when you're looking at them, they look uh, similar. Yeah. Um, Alert? Yeah, so the, the key thing is that you have to record decent uh, or some sound on the other device as well. So uh, if it's a, for example, a DSLR camera, uh, you must make sure that, you know, normally they have a built-in mic, but you can disable it. So you must make sure you haven't disabled it. So there's some sound. Uh, the clap's important, particularly if you're a bit of a distance away. If you're quite close by, you can do what Elijah says, which is match the sound wave. And then we particularly look for the B sounds, the B, because you're, you're, you can see it on the mouth. The B is the one sound which has a really short little moment. So as soon as your mouth opens, that's when the explosion happens. So you can see it on the sound wave. It makes a little bump. So you line those up. Um, but if it, that can take a little bit of time. So if you don't have that kind of patience, there are some software that actually does it for you. Or yeah. um, so, so Premiere, for example, does it automatically. 
Uh, you can also get a kind of plugin called, uh, I think it's called Four Eyes. Um, and if you don't have the budget for that, maybe you could persuade a friend who's got it or who's working at a facility to quickly sync something up to you and send it back to you. Um, I actually, you know, we've really been talking very much about, uh, you know, the, the, the theatre and the arts industry very much going it all out alone. And uh, I actually think we also really need to look at the, you know, our filmmaking industry, our kind of uh, video television industry as well, because there's a lot of people, particularly young people coming out of, you know, institutions like ours who kind of looking for their first break. And particularly if you're working with an artist, that's maybe something you want to put on your CV, you know, you could, make your money out of a, you know, filming some corporate events and weddings, but then you'd love to also have, you know, a theatrical performance as something. So I think people need to reach out as well. Instead of, you know, having to learn all these things from scratch, uh, why not collaborate? So I would also encourage people to find, uh, maybe connect with institutions like uh, ourselves, the after campuses, UCT, whatever, and, um, uh, find ways to to collaborate more yeah that's um i think that that's been the key thing that i think across every single webinar um that that we've held so far has been the watchword i think nikki pilkington said it um uh collaborate 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 um and i think that that where we have often filmmakers and theatre makers have been very far apart. I think now is a time when, when we are going to start coming together a lot more and finding a cohesive way um, of using our specific mm -hmm. tools and talents together um, and creating work that is, is quite astonishing. Um, mm -hmm. We have um, a comment that's come in, and this one is particularly interesting, Bronwyn. Um, uh, this is from Aaron Washington, who's in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, this is a hard time for our world, um, but at the same time, a revolution of tech is present. What paths do you feel this will open up for international artists to connect across the diasporas? Um, you know, just in, in terms of finding places where we can now connect. Um, how do you see the, the future of artistic collaboration or you know sort of how we attach ourselves to other people and how we we find a common way of telling a story mm. yeah i mean absolutely i think that uh we're all seeing it it's it's obvious but it's at the same time completely surprising because uh it, it really does extend our conversation um that is often very local uh, to to this kind of international space where you begin to recognize that there's a community of thinking that is much broader than our city or our country. And um, on the one hand, uh, just to reiterate um, Slendile's point and what Mabuat has been focused on, and, and certainly interestingly what the centers uh, one of our key points is to archive and to to capture our processes and what's happening um, in a in this part of the world with performance art. Um, I think that the collaborations become really exciting beyond just our country borders when thinking about this because we now have this um, opportunity to really use the communication devices that are at hand and something that I've noticed that's happened quite a lot is um, in the long minute for example an artist has sent me a, a minute long clip um, there's something intriguing about it let's say the visual aspect of it or the, the kind of performance the the way this person is expressing themselves um, as a performer on the camera, but the actual text or, or the sound is rather either derivative or boring or predictive or, um, and, and there's a, at the same time within the last few weeks, I've received a really beautiful sound clip um, or piece that has a really interesting sound quality. And so what I've been doing is, is matching the two, introducing them to one another. Um, you know, one sitting in Portugal, the other one sitting in um, 
Alex and saying, this is something that I find interesting, this kind of serendipitous uh, meeting of of your your sound and your visual um, and and there's a whole other kind of storytelling that comes out of that and a connection and a collaboration um, and so you know in the in the small fragmented very easy to do way I think that is our first step into understanding um, what's possible and as the center we've been wondering about things like what exquisite corpse poetry or video looks like um, as you sort of rely also on the chance meetings of things as people are simultaneously responding to the various conditions of this global pandemic you know i think there's a lot of um surprises and unknowns that we can play with by just opening up and communicating with one another and um, also using institutions and, and spaces like the Centre, like the National Arts Festival, as a portal to finding artists in spaces that we can't physically be, but mm. um, we can really travel to now um, and communicate with. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's very much the world in, in the same breath is becoming bigger and smaller. Um, and, you know, sort of, so many things are impossible to do, but so much more has become very differently possible. Um, yeah. And, you know, just looking at the, at the way that we're working with our team, um, where we're all sitting in different uh, different cities, um, mm -hmm. and we're still able to very effectively um, collaborate in order to make this 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 festival a reality. So I, I definitely am, am one for believing that it might it might well make creative world especially a lot a lot smaller in some ways um, yeah. this is a question for um slindila um, does mabu foundation um help theater makers archive their work um and what about people who do not have access to resources particularly those who are starring in their work mm, that's a good question um what we started to realize in the beginning of this pandemic is that not everybody is going to have access to resources, equipment, and adapting to the style. So I think one of the most important things that we started to really think about was reaching out to festivals like the um, National Arts Festival of how can we help with our resources? How can we help with what we've got to collaborate and to, and to help um, theater makers who are starting up? Because I never forget about myself who started up in 2016 at the in the fringe um, community which was a really hard community and it's still very hard right now and we had no resources we still don't have resources but i think it's just asking for help where you can and maybe sending an email or, or we can maybe give you advice of how to film the work using a phone or how to of how or how to record a voice over but i think what we're really interested in now is helping wherever we can, because I think it is important now for theater makers to understand that National Arts Festival is basically like our Netflix. So how do we make sure that um, we get our work seen? And this is an yeah. opportunity for you to be put on a global scale. So don't be scared. Ask where you can, and we can help where we can as well. Absolutely. Um, our next question. Um, um, it comes from Sami Maseko. Um, my question about is about the integrity of story in terms of filming live performance. What do you think is the best way to maintain that? Um, I think that that's a definitely a Slindila and a Let um, question, possibly. Um, how do you maintain the story and how do you maintain the integrity um, as the storyteller? Oh, should I go? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's important that when we were filming the, the, the two previous examples that I showed earlier, was that you've got to treat it that as if your audience is there. Unfortunately, in those ones, the audience was there in, 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 in the past mm -hmm. examples. But, I mean, the previous examples. But what I really encourage actors now to think about when your works are going to be filmed is not to stop because um, 
it's not about cut. We're not cutting. You got to still maintain the story. And a lot of people are very scared to have a camera. A lot of actors, dancers are really scared when the camera now all of a sudden is, is placed in the room and they feel like they have to overperform. I just think it's just, I just think it's just staying pure to what you know from the rehearsal process, what you, what you felt in that rehearsal process and still maintaining the same energy that you and your colleagues have and your, and the relationship with your, with your character and the story and what it meant, what it's meant to communicate across. Um, so don't stop when you're filming your work, still really maintain that discipline of the show must still go on. Absolutely. Um, Alex, I don't know if you've got some. Yes, some... I, I would say the essential thing is that you have to shift from thinking that you're performing to an audience and to think that you're performing to, uh, you know, for one person. Uh, that's really the, the crucial difference between, uh, you know, film video and a, a theatre performance. So I would encourage people to think, you know, nearly as if they are um, uh, doing a, a video note or something. Uh, they, and to visualize, you know, who exactly you, you're talking to. You've got to get a sense, a very clear sense of who your character is and who your character is talking to. And if you've imagined those, I think that will really helps a lot towards the process. Also, you've got to think in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the point the previous speaker make about, made about the short shortness of the film. So you've really got to have a clear narrative structure. Uh, you've got to have a real strong sense of what it is that your character wants and what it is that the, the character's up against uh, and mm. introduce that quite early in the story. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, oh, the team is, um, uh, is asking me, because uh, they're getting a lot of questions, as to how the virtual fringe works. Um, so before I go to, because we, we, we're steaming through this hour and a half, um, before I, I go to sort of final closing, closing up with, with, the, with the panelists, um, I just want to go over again um, some of the, the, the aspects of the V Fringe um, and submitting work there. There is an entire webinar um, dedicated to submitting work on the on the V Fringe with a very fancy PowerPoint presentation um, that was presented by um, Zakona uh, Monaghan, who's our Fringe manager last week. Um, and basically, the virtual Fringe works as a pay-per-view video on demand platform. So if you have a piece that you want to um, put on the put on the internet and um, let people see for a price per view. Um, then this is the platform that you would use to do that. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to make um, the platform be as open as possible by making sure that artists take the lion's share of the takings that they generate on that platform. So everything that 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 um, you that so you would as the artist would take ninety percent of the ticket sales um, accruing from from the platform. Um, at the moment, for the run of for work that is being presented. Um, as part of this year's National Arts Festival. There is no registration fee to join, um, to, to submit work for the Virtual Fringe. Um, so you can submit anything that you want as long as it fits within the guidelines um, of not being um, crazy violent um, or you know, sort of overtly inappropriate. Um, and um, the link to um, submitting work is is done through sorry i'm not making any sense at all um the form for submitting work is um available on our homepage um through the artist zone you'll find the form there which will take you through the process and um the the file formats um that we are looking for work on um, you can tell us about your work you can submit us um submit some photographs and what we'll do is that we um, is that we'll, we'll then put that on our streaming server and it will be available um, for the public uh, to have a look um, at. Um, 
so as we sort of start to wrap up the session, I just want to whip around um, and I'll start with you, Bronwyn. Um, what are your top two tips to take away that artists can take away from this session? Uh, yeah, I think, um, again, reiterating the collaboration and to um, not only collaborate, obviously, between artists and disciplines, you know, that's what the center founds itself on but to really consider uh, other kinds of um, makers that you know, uh, sound engineers and technicians, lighting engineers and operators, um, to, to make in their various spaces, or if you're able to get permission to be with one another, um, I think that's essential. Um, don't, you know, as much as we have been socially, physically distanced from one another, um, don't forget that you're in a community of making and there are things that people will do that you haven't anticipated that that sits somewhere inside of you as part of what you're wanting to say with this work. Mm. Uh, and then to keep it, um, to keep it short and to keep it, or, or to keep it the, the length that it needs to be. Uh, one of the most irritating questions that happens all the time at the center as we're working is how, you know, somebody's proposed their work, they're in development, they're writing the script, and then they ask us as the center how long it needs to be. Yeah. It's the most ridiculous question, but I know why it comes, and it's because mm. we're used to, um, that's the economics of the theater, right? That's the economics of a festival. It says, well, you have to do this for 60 minutes in order for it to be worthwhile. The fact that we're liberated from that right now is something that is really exciting. And whilst I reiterate the, the short form, um, I must say there's also something possible in the long form because people can go and come away at leisure. Uh, yesterday or the day before I sat and I watched The Encounter, um, which I have known about for a long time and never had the opportunity. It's Simon McBurney's piece at The Barbican. Um, and it's over two hours, and it is the most excruciatingly beautiful experience. And I think, had I been in the audience, that would have been nice. But being on my couch with him in my ears, um, and still having the same dynamic sound experience that he offers is extraordinary. And in some ways, um, you know, I know I sound like an optimist now, and I'm as I still mourn the physical and I want to be back in theatres and I, I, I understand too well the devastation of what we're experiencing, but there are things that are coming out of this that are truly, um, I don't think we would have found without this crisis mm. uh, and, and it's to push those as far as we can go. Absolutely. Um, Amy and Francois. You, you don't get a two for one on this one. Right? You, you both have to give us, uh, your, your, each of you give us your top two bits taking away from this session. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to just follow on from what Bronwyn said and, you know, to, to, to not think that we have to recreate, like, like Alit said, recreate the Hollywood look and to really kind of push your own language and find your own language and use these new tools. I mean, we, 50 years ago would, would have been impossible, it would have been a whole um, truck full of, you know, filming equipment to be able to um, have what you can put in, in a backpack these days in mm. terms of being able to edit on site. You can have small lights that are as strong as these big bulbs used to be. Mm. You could literally pack all of this into a backpack, you know, tripod, um, what have you. Um, and, and as well as there being software that does effects and does filters and, and all of that. So I think it's, it's really for, for individuals to be able to take that as far as they want and to kind of find their own voice within, within this moment and to, to say, mm. you know, we, you can tell your own story. You can represent the way that you see the world. In, and there are no rules, really. You can break the rules. There's no, you know, you've got to follow the rules of cinema or the, or the rules of, of theatre. It's like you can make them up. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I also think like, like Bronwyn said, you know, as a theatre maker, I, we're in, we are in a period of mourning. Like this is a, a lot of us are grieving the fact that we can't be physically at the festival. Um, 
but I, for me, the thing is like, rather than trying to simply take your work that you were going to imagine for the stage and put it into a digital format, it's like a, it's a um, conceptual shift. Um, like, you know, we can't recreate, we simply cannot recreate that experience of that intimacy of um, between audience and performer. There's no way that we can recreate that experience. So we have to think like, what are experiences that are possible on the internet that would not have been possible live? And that's, you know, with smartphones, there's something pretty um, radical and subversive about the way that smartphones have democratized this process and given people access that would otherwise not have had access. So, yeah. yeah, I think I agree with Bronwyn in that something radical and positive can come out of a time of, of crisis. Absolutely. Um, Slindila, you, have you got any final thoughts for us? Um, I just think um, what everyone's saying is just you got to play, you got to trust your story, um, you got to find ways to um, get into a digitalized audience now, who will pause, who will go back to playing, but make sure that they don't pause your story. Um, and, and just be gutsy because there's no rules. And what I really love is that um, you can play with your form and nobody knows what the script or what the actual original um, play was like. So you can do it however way you want to do it. And yeah, I think it's, it's exciting for South African contemporary, South African um, theater to really move into a space where it deserves to be now. So I think, yeah, just come with all your guns and let's play. Oh, absolutely. Um, Elijah, have you got some final final thoughts for us? Um, I th um, yeah, I think I just want to go back to uh, what, what what was said at the beginning, and that you know uh, you 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 have to take some time and just you know uh, study the equipment that you, you you have got if you it doesn't matter what it is study it and know what it can do so that at the end you you uh, record something that will be decent and the second thing for me is your ear uh, because I'm talking from the sound perspective your ear is a very important thing you know trust your ear whatever that you are hearing that is not right it means everybody else who will be hearing uh, what you're recording is gonna hear that and they're not gonna like it. So your ear is your best friend. Yes, it is indeed. And yeah. um, Alette. Yes, uh, uh, Nikki, I think, you know, for me, what's the most exciting about this whole process is uh, I'm quite excited about what this collaboration is gonna mean for the film and uh, video industry in South Africa because I think to some extent, you know, we've, we've been quite polished and technically glib, but we haven't had, you know, we've had some creative energy, but I think really the, you know, the cutting edge are the other people in, in theater and experimental dance and, and you know, um, uh, fine art performance. And, and I think that, you know, those collaborations are going to create fantastic things. Uh, I think actually that the National Arts Festival should think about appro approaching the um, uh, National Film and uh, Video Foundation to possibly look at, um, or maybe, you know, some body, probably you best placed, to try and get some funding for people to work together to create a whole lot of short films together. I think that's a real possibility and that's really going to inject a lot of energy into our, our video um, performances, just listening to people describe their processes. I think that's also something that people need to look at, you know. I would really like to pay to watch how Amy and Francois do this kind of lo-fi thing, perhaps more so than to actually see the films. And the same with the Less Good Idea Center. I I'm really interested in the processes that you guys follow. So I think, you know, seriously, people should think about creating, you know, if you look at vloggers, that's what they often do. It's like commentary on how things work and, you know, describing a, a real skill, a process. And I don't think people should neglect that. So don't only think of performances. Also think about documenting your process. 
Absolutely. And as I listen to listen to all of you, it, it seems like we actually haven't moved very far away from the space that we normally occupy, um, which is collaborate, play with the tools and play in the space and make up your own rules. It's sort of what we do anyway. Um, uh, we just have to find the find the way to do that. Um, and even though it is tremendously tough, um, I think that theatre folk and and people in our industry are particularly resilient. Um, and we, I think that we will find um, a definite way through this, um, and a, and something and a spark um, that will send us send us sort of into the great unknown, so to speak. Um, would you look at that? We we have eaten up an hour and a half, um, and I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank very much um, all of our panelists. It's been fantastic talking to you all, um, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you in some way um, over the next sort of month as we get to the very scary prospect of presenting a digital festival for the first time. Um, I'd like to say to all of the, the attendees, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and just for everybody to please keep a lookout um, uh, on the Artist Zone, um, which is where we're posting any and all opportunities. We keep um, working and looking for more points of collaboration for artists um, and, and sort of places where we can where we can make platforms available um, and if you join us on friday afternoon at 2 p.m um, our next webinar in the series is marketing your work online and how to create and generate audiences in the online space um, and so with that i say thank you very much and um, thanks very much for joining us all cheers <laughs>